I was working on the Word, and um, and I was thinking about how good are Australians, and how good is Australia? I mean, that's what Morrison said, and it was awesome to say it at the time. And and I just thought, the Church of God. How good is the Church of God? How good are Christians? I mean. We are amazing when you really think about it. We really are. I have heard plenty of people knock the church. You know, it's not where it's supposed to be. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. And, you know, it's dropped the ball and blah, blah, blah. I mean, yes, we have done that. We have done that. In the world, there's approximately 7.7 billion people right now on Earth. Out of that 7.7 .7 billion, there is 584 professing Pentecostal, spirit-filled Christians. I think that's pretty amazing. Absolutely amazing. Not enough. Million. Did I not say million? <laughs> if there was only 584 of it, that would be pretty sad. I'm sorry. Million. <laughs> In Australia, we have approximately 25.1 million people and probably 548 Christians. <laughs> but in our last census, it was reported that 52.1% claim to be Christian as their religion. They are Christian. In that same census, it said over 400,000 people were Pentecostal Christians in Australia, which is still awesome. But did you know, Hillsong have apparently 100,000 of those people. Just in Australia, with all their churches, all their campuses, every time they get together, 100,000. That is amazing. The church rose up and prayed and interceded and asked God for a righteous leader for this, for this nation at our last election. Bill Shorten lost the unlosable election for Labor. And we, he will never, ever, ever be Prime Minister of this great nation of ours, ever. As we know, Scott Morrison won, and he said it was a miracle. Oh, it was applause. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I'm with you. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the army of the Lord. In Australia, the church, the church of the living God, feeds thousands every day, clothes thousands every day, shelters thousands every day and every night. Chaplains minister to thousands every day, whether it's in the defence force, the fireys, the police, the ambos. There's all, they're also ministering in the schools, and not just to the school children, but to their families and to the outer community of that school. They go into the hospitals and they deal with the sick and the lonely and the dying. And when someone's dying there, they start dealing with the family there as well and the extended family. The church is a mighty force. The church is moving in Australia. It's not just sitting there. We're doing what God has called us to do. We, we may meet in different places, we may talk differently, but we are one body serving the one God. There are hundreds and thousands of us praying for our land every day and every week when we get together. People getting saved at church, going to discipleship groups, learning about our God, going to home group meetings, healing meetings, healing rooms, you name it. People are meeting during the week. This is the church. And they're proclaiming the good news that Jesus is Lord. Seeing people set free from addictions in healing rooms, prayer rooms, counselling rooms, marriages being restored, families being brought back together, people getting saved at church and going to disciple groups and growing and learning. Churches praying for the sick, praying for other churches. Mission trips planned and fulfilled. People being set free there and healed and delivered. Lives touched by the Holy Spirit in worship services. Thousands of young people going to youth group on weekends. 
The church is in good hands. God is moving. We might not see it the way we want it, but we should let God be God and let him do it his way. Can the church do better? Yeah, sure, of course it can. We can do better. Are we going to bag it out or are we going to pray for it and play our part in the body? I think we'll play our part. Instead of bagging it out, instead of saying things about the church, we will be the church. We are the body. When the body hurts in one area, we're supposed to feel that. But even, that's got nothing to do with what I'm even preaching about. That was just a, how good is the church of God in Australia? We rock. I mean, we really do. I mean, too many people say too many bad things about it. We rock. I mean, the, the church is just so amazing. So amazing. I have had so many people ask me uh, to say the prophetic word that I said I think about four weeks ago. Um, so I thought, before I do anything, I'll, I will do that. Uh, I said it on the 28th, Sunday the 28th of last month. Beloved, I am raising up an army of warriors. Actually, it was, it was pretty cool. Once I read through this last night and then looked at the election, I thought, oh, God, you are so cool. You are very cool. Beloved, I am raising up an army of warriors but not like what man would think warriors would be. I look at the heart, not the outside appearance. I want soft hearts towards me. The warriors I am raising up are mighty intercessors, men and women and younger ones who seek me diligently, who pray and worship me in spirit and in truth, who are in my word and who are applying it. When opposition comes against them, they don't run and take no for an answer because they stand firm and on the decrees and the promises of my word. So be strong and courageous by the power of my might. That's what matters. There is a tsunami of wickedness coming against this nation. Everywhere you look, it's hitting with power. Like water, it keeps rising higher and higher. But my body, the church, it's been asleep and allowed this to happen. But there have been pockets of my people on fire, fighting and praying fervently against this attack. I am bringing more and more of the saints to join this battle. I am raising an army, a mighty army of warrior intercessors to bring this nation back to my son, back to my values, back to my beliefs back to my morals, back to my blessings. I don't want any more lip service from my people. I want my beloved to come back to their first love, that excitement and faith to believe for anything, to believe my word is real, powerful, to achieve what is sent out to do because I watch over it to perform it. I am ready to pour out my spirit upon this nation in a way the world has never seen or experienced before. This new wave of my spirit will start on this nation and people from all over the world will come here to be a part of what I am doing, to see it, to feel it, to be in it. I will be, it will be more powerful than any other revival outpouring I have allowed before. I have declared this from the throne in the heavens. This anointing is so strong and heavy and it is ready to be poured out now. It's ready now. I am ready to do this now. But the gates of hell have opened to try and prevent this outpouring to come to pass, to stop, and to stop this and any more of my spirit and the outpouring of my power. This is why the evil, evil is so prevalent across your nation. But I have not declared, sorry, but have I not declared when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him? Doesn't my word say upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not pre prevail against it? Have I not said if I am for you, who can be against you? I will strengthen you. I will surely help you. I, I will lift, hold you 
with my right hand of righteousness. I am ready to release my spirit across this nation now to pray and intercede that hold of the, that the hold of the evil one will be broken so I can radically change and pour out my spirit on all flesh so they will come back to me. I have spoken this. I have declared it from my throne. It shall come to pass. It shall be ushered in, says the Lord. I have never, ever once in my life gotten up and spoken about political parties, but I tell you what, if Morrison did not get in, the evil would have risen higher and higher and higher. The church stood, came together, prayed, and we believed and prayed and believed and prayed and believed and God trumped it again. We have a spirit-filled, God-believing, born-again Prime Minister, the highest ranking of this nation. He runs this nation. I mean, Mr. Morrison isn't perfect, just like you and me. He will make mistakes just like you and me. But I tell you what, I'm so glad that he is at the top of this nation. So today I want to talk about push. Has anyone heard push before? You have. Awesome. Awesome. I did a little um, demonstration when I, I pushed one of uh, Kevin's kids before. So that's what push is. <laughs> push. Pray until something happens. Pray until something happens. Maybe Joe should be here preaching this and I'll just do the, the prophetic. I don't know. We'll see if Neil watches this and gives me a, a scorecard. Every one of us have to deal with life every day. The ups and downs, the positives, the negatives, the good, the bad, the ugly, life and death itself. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be Scott Morrison. You could be the Queen. You could be Benny Hinn. We all go through trials and tribulations, big or small. We all go through it. But how do we handle it? Do we come out of it better or worse are we we are blessed that we have god's word to look through to guide us through these times so when the when using the word of god and praying that's our only key for success to be victorious and triumph over these things that we that we deal with if we sit back and just hope for the best nothing will change our circumstances stay the same or can get even worse. Push. It's a verb. It's a doing word. So we've got to do something here. If it's a push and a doing word and a verb, do it. Like the Nike slogan, just, just do it. If we are Christians, we are Christ followers. And we imitate what he did. And he was always praying. The will of his father. So Jesus prayed and then followed through with his actions. So whatever the father spoke to him about, he did it. So the first thing we need to do is to identify what we're going through. What's holding us up. What life has thrown at us and what we need to deal with. Find the scriptures to deal with these things. Do a list. My wife is into lists, so this is why I'm saying a list. Do a list. Write it out. Have it in front of you. Have a plan of attack. Once we have the scriptures, then pray them back to God. Because in Jeremiah 1.12, the Lord says to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. So speak out the word so God can do his bit as well. He wants to do it. He wants to be a part of our life. He wants to help us in every area. So if we speak it out, he will watch over it. He'll make sure it comes to pass and he'll do his bit. Did you know that in the word, 134 times 
we are told to pray. 134 times we are told to trust God. 141 times we are told to wait on the Lord. 365 times in the word, God tells us that he is with us. So one for every day, I'm guessing. 365 times as well, in the word, God tells us, don't be afraid or fearful. If we don't pray, nothing will happen except your circumstances can get worse. And this isn't just about doom and gloom, far from it. It's about push, pray until something happens. Allow God to move in your life. Allow God to change the circumstances in your life and around your life because life will be so much better for you. If we want results in your life, pray until something happens. If you want to change in your family situation, pray until something happens. If you need God's hand in health, pray until that situation changes. If you need a breakthrough in anything, push. If you're happy the way things are, don't push. Just stay the way you are. To push is also to be consistent in being spiritually minded. You, you are aware that God is working things out for good when we stand in agreement with his word and his ways. We must ask ourselves, could I ask someone to please grab me a glass of water? Oh, thank you, Troy. I'll give you a word. No, I'm kidding, kidding, kidding. See, that's where I'll get in trouble. <laughs> we must ask ourselves a few things through, the, through to prevent frustration. Sometimes, if we have unrealistic expectations, and we don't get certain prayers answered the way we want them, we stop praying as faithfully as we used to so we don't get disappointed. I mean, who's done that before? I've done that. Thinking, no, I'm not praying that way. I didn't get that car. Forget it. I'm not praying like that again. It's all good. The book of James says that we can be praying amiss or to gratify our own pleasures. We are told in Scripture to pray with all kinds of prayers and petitions. We need to be aware that if we are praying stale, thanks, mate, and repetitive prayers, why? Why bother? We need to keep our prayer life vibrant and specific and exciting. I know sometimes when you're going through it, that's very, very hard. But God is the God of the impossible. He is the God of push. Pray until something happens. And when you're praying, when you come up and out of that situation, it's amazing what God can do for you. It's amazing how he can change the atmosphere. If you're depressed, force yourself to put that smile on your face. Smile at someone else. And then you see that other smile come back and it's like, oh, it worked. Look at that. Yeah, and you do feel better. You know, it, God is very cool in what he does and what he expects us to do and how we are supposed to react. In this way, we are essentially saying, Jesus, I want to invite you into every aspect of my life. If we're praying vibrantly, if we're praying with excitement, we need to look at what we're praying for. Is it a concept or a promise from Scripture that lines up with the purposes of God? Like, are we praying for salvation for our family? Boldness for ourselves to really minister to someone? Maybe it's just for work so we can provide for our families, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Wisdom for a situation or resolution in our own life or helping someone else. When we pray, we are coming before him boldly, as a child, but keeping our hearts humble and asking him to incline his ear to our prayer and to hear us. Do we allow room that God may choose to do things differently 
because he sees the big picture. I sometimes stumble with this one. Sometimes I stumble with this one. I think this is how it needs to be. Like looking at a plan, because I'm a carpenter, I look at a plan, this is how I'm going to build that. That's how it's going to go. If I erect it like that, it's all going to be good. It's going to be strong, going to be fantastic. Hold the roof, take the weight, all that type of year, it's going to work. I know what I'm doing. But with God, we don't always know. We don't see the big picture. We don't get the plan. We don't get the over, you know, the, the end result. He doesn't tell us that. Even in prophetic words, when people, you know, get a word like, like, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, this is how it's going to happen, this is what it's going to be like, you know, you're going to love it, you're going to be so successful, it's going to be fantastic, and you're going to pour out my blessings, and all this is going to happen, you're just going to run around the world and preach the gospel and see thousands saved, and it's going to be fantastic. That there, in every word, there is always, you know, if you're not seeking my face, if you're not into, into me, if you're not doing what my spirit wants, if you're not following the, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, well, none of that's going to work, none of that's going to help you, or will happen there's always you know you've got to do this to get that so you might get a word but am i speaking gibberish is any everyone following me are we we on the same page i was expecting millie to be shouting today from neil's word last week i really was but nothing i've got nothing it's all right it's all right can we honestly say if things go differently than, than what the way we... I'll start that again. Can we honestly say if things go differently than what we want, that will be fine because we have prayed confidently how we think we should go, inviting him, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, to move on us or on others, others' behalves, but we'll keep soldiering on behind him if it doesn't go, doesn't go the way we thought. This is still push, pushing, because something has happened. His child has interceded, but the situation and God either did something or didn't on purpose because of the way we prayed. So if we're praying amiss, God won't bless that, won't la allow that to happen. If we're praying out of his will, of course God's not going to do that. He will do his will, but he will still show us what his will is so we can pray into that. So if we're praying into what his will is, it's going to be wonderful for us. To push also showing to th the fruit of the Spirit, patience, endurance. We live in a fast-paced world, but have... But are we satisfied with God's timing? Everything is instant, except God. That's why they call him the Ancient of Days. You'd, he always comes through. Don't get me wrong. Always. God always comes through. It's usually 11.59.59. But God always comes through. He's often working in the background where we don't see it or don't even know what's going on there. But God's working for us. He also makes us wait at times because he cares more about our character and our attitude than the outcome of the something, what we're praying for and what we're waiting for. Be patient in the waiting. Stay consistent in our prayers and our praise. In our praise? Yes, our praise. Push can also mean praise until something happens. Sometimes God desires for us to praise him in the waiting as a sign of trust. When we're praying and praising, whether we get the answer we want or not, something can shift powerfully on the inside of us. We can get a new revelation and new insights to God the way, the way God sees things. With push, I think there is one more thing we must do, and that's stand. Having done all, stand. Just one simple word, fairly easy action, not much thinking required, 
but it's not really our go-to position, is it? You pray and then you stand. Stand firm. Stand ready. Usually, we rely on our automatic fight or flight, the response that we face an obstacle or an adversary. Sometimes we pull ourselves together, gather our resources and prepare to fight. Other times we run for cover, hoping to protect ourselves from any of the shrapnel that happens in that battle. Yet God offers an, an alternative for us. Alternative, that's the word I was trying to say. Stand. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take up, stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly plate realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of the evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done all in everything, stand. I think it's four times in there. We are to stand. Push until something happens and then stand. Take that stance of a warrior, of an intercessor warrior. Stand. Stand firm. Pray until something happens and then stand firm. Not in our might or in our power, but in the power of the Lord. Because if, if it's not in that, we're, we're just doing it for ourselves. And I know that for me, I can't do anything. You know, I can't heal anyone. I can't make anyone better. I can't make your life better unless I had like a million dollars that I could throw around, but I don't have that, so I can't, can't do that. But with God, when you're in his power, when you're working in his might, when you're working in his will, the world changes. With God, he is the world changer. I'm going to leave you with one thought. Hey, this is pretty quick. No mucking around today. Knowing we live in the age of grace, we were saved in it. I'll start that again, sorry. Knowing we live in the age of grace and we were saved in it should give us knee-weakening heart-stopping gratitude to Jesus. And knowing what is ahead for the world and its people should give us knee-weakening, heart-stopping fear of God and his almighty power and holy wrath because he is coming soon. Be ready. Live like you're ready. Witness like this is your last day on earth. Because it could be for you or for that person. Plan like Jesus is not returning. Live like he's coming back today. Thank you. I see that hand. You're only amening because it was finished. I, I got an email from my mother um, in 2011. I don't think I've got an email since. Now, she sent me a, a prophecy by a 90-year-old woman in Norway. So I'm going to finish on this. So this is absolutely amazing. This was in 1968. 
an old woman of 90 years old from Valdez in Norway had a vision from God in 1968. The evangelist Emmanuel Min Minos had meetings and services where she lived. He had the opportunity to meet her and she told him what she had seen. He wrote it down but thought it might be unintelligible that he put it into his drawer. Not now, almost 30 years later, he understands that he must share the vision with others. The woman was, a, was very alert, reliable, awake, and, credi and a credible Christian with a good reputation among all who knew her. And this is what she saw. I saw the time just before the coming of Jesus and the outbreak of the Third World War. I saw the events with my natural eyes. I saw the world like a kind of globe. I saw Europe land by land. I saw Scandinavia. I saw Norway. I saw certain things that would take place just before the return of Jesus. And just before the last calamity happens, a calamity like of which we have never experienced before. She mentions four waves. Number one, first, before Jesus comes and before the Third World War breaks out, there will be like a, a deity like we have never had before. I may be saying that word wrong. Is there a school teacher in the house? What's this say, Kevin? See if I've got this right. Come up here, come on, come on don't be shy. For my lovely assistant, can you please give him a hand? That word there. De Dante. All right, it's not deity, all right, because I got that wrong and I thought, oh, that's wrong. Okay, that's a thank you. Um, so, there's going to be like that, like we've never had before. There will be peace between the super, superpowers in the East and the West, and there will be a long peace. Remember, this was back in 1968 when the Cold War was at its highest. In this period of peace, there will be a disarmament in many countries, also in Norway, and they will not be prepared when it, the war, comes. The Third World War will begin in a way no one would have anticipated and from an unexpected place. Number two, a lukewarmness without parallel will take hold of Christians, a falling away from true living Christianity. Christians will not be open for penetrating the preaching, for penetrating preaching. They will not like, they will not like in earlier times what to hear, want to hear of sin and grace, law and gospel, repentance and restoration. There will come a substitute instead, prosperity, happiness, Christianity. The important thing will be to have success, to be something, to have material things, things that God never promised us in this way. Churches and prayer houses will become emptier and emptier. Instead of preaching, we, will, we have been used, which, which we have been used to for the generations, like to have your cross up and to take your cross up and to follow Jesus. It will be entertainment, art and culture will invade the churches. There should where there should have been gatherings for repentance and revival. This will increase markedly just before the return of Jesus. Number three, there will be moral in disinterrogation. Disinter moral, morals are going to drop bad. <laughs> the old Norway has never experienced the likes of 
People will live together like being married, but without being married. Much uncleanness and cleanliness before marriage and much infidelity in marriage will become the natural, the common. And it will be justified from every angle. It will even enter Christian circles and we pet it. Even sin against nature. Just before Jesus returns, there will be TV programs like we have never experienced. And at this time, TV had just arrived in Norway. TV will be filled with horrible violence. It will teach people to murder and destroy each other. It will be unsafe in our streets. People will copy what they see. There will not only be one station on TV, it will be filled with stations. She, they didn't have a clue that it would be channels, so it was called stations. Therefore, yes, yeah, she called them stations. TV will be just like the radio. We will have many stations and it will be filled with violence. People will use it for entertainment. We will see terrible scenes of murder, destruction of one another. This will spread in society. Sex scenes will be shown on the screen. The most intimate things that take place in marriage. And he has in brackets, I protested and said, we have a paragraph that forbids any of this kind of thing. There, the old woman said, it will happen and you will see it. All we have, been, all we have had before will be broken down. And the most indecent things will pass before our eyes. Number four, people from poor countries will stream into Europe. In 1968, there was no such thing as immigration. They will also come into Scandinavia and Norway. There will be so many of them, that the people will begin to dislike them and become hard with them. They will be treated like the Jews before the Second World War then the full measure of our sins will have been reached. The tears stream down from the old woman's eyes, down her cheeks. I will not see it, but you will. Then suddenly Jesus will come and the third world war breaks out. It will be a short war. She saw this in a vision, she says. All that I have seen of war before is only child's play compared to this one. And it will be ended with a nuclear atom bomb. The air will be so polluted that one cannot draw one's breath. It will cover several continents, America, Japan, Australia, and the wealthy nations. The water will be ruined and contaminated. We can no longer till the soil. The result will be that the remnant will remain. The remnant in the wealthy countries will try to flee to the poor countries, but it will be hard, but they will be as hard on us as we were on them. She goes on to say, I'm so glad that I will not be here to see this, but when the time draws near, you must take courage and tell this. I have received it from God and nothing goes against what the Bible tells. The one who has sin, forgiven, has his Jesus as Saviour and Lord, is safe. She goes on to say that um, he was a young man um, when he received this prophecy. I'm not 100% sure how old he was, but she said that you will see this happen in your lifetime. So if this is back in 1968, you know, that's um, 51 years ago-ish. That's right, isn't it? Teacher? Yes. So yeah, certainly, certainly. So I believe that, um, like I said just before, live like Jesus isn't plan like Jesus isn't returning, but live like he's coming back today. That's an old prophecy, and um, a lot of that stuff has come to pass. We're seeing it right now. It's all there.
God is amazing. I don't mean to put a damper on anything like that, but we've got to be aware. We've got to be ready. We've got to know that you know we are in times where Jesus can come back. Jesus can come back any time. You know, it's, it's only a matter of time. So, saints, be blessed. All right, last, last one, Sharon. <laughs> um, I just believe that the Lord has actually been saying that you've got a word right now that you want to share. So I get things like that all the time. So the Lord, I really believe the Lord is just saying to me now that you've got something. So if you have something, I've got a microphone here for you. And then uh, I didn't put it on. And I will sit down. No, actually, God was speaking to me yesterday. He just said two words to me. He said, sword and shield. And I said, well, yes, Lord, yes, I know. I've got my sword and my shield. But he, just kept, he said it even louder. He said, sword and shield. And like we're saying today, we know that God's our shield and that God is our sword that goes before us. But he was saying to me that I have given you a sword and a shield, that you must use your sword and be... Um, I think I've shared it with some people before that you need to be able to use it with your left and your right, like David's God, God's mighty, his mighty men. They were able to fight on either side, but they're able to use the, the shield of faith. And I see God, you talk about you being our shield, but that my shield is actually my faith. That when I want to go into battle, yes, the sword is an attacking weapon, but my shield is my defensive weapon as well. So I need to be able to put it forward. I need to be able to, to block. I need to be able to cover. I need to be able to, have the, to use it effectively. But what is my shield? My shield is my faith. I can do things and I have the ability to do things, but I don't do them because sometimes we hide behind our shield, and but a shield is not to be hidden behind. A shield is to go forward with. A shield is faith is to go forward with, to push, to not just stand. At times we are called to stand, but at times we're called to push. And that's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hopeful, the evidence of things unseen. So if there's things in your life that is unseen, that you want them to be seen, that you want them to go, you need to pick up your sword, you need to pick up your shield of faith and push and go forward. Amen? One thing that Neil said to me was, make sure you have an altar call and pray. And I sat down. <laughs> so let's not kill him. All right. Um, actually, I have a, a pain right in the back, right somewhere, right about there, and uh, it's not my pain. Uh, I don't know if anyone has that pain, but um, you don't even have to come out. If you just acknowledge that, I know that God will heal that. I thank you right now, Lord, anyone who has that pain is healed in the name of Jesus. Loose that pain. Let it go right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that you are our God that heals us in Jesus' name. Um, a real, I know this is pretty easy, but a real stiffness in the neck, really, but um, real, really stiff in the neck. And sometimes uh, I keep getting like a, a left eye sort of shudder, blinky, fuzzy, um, that as well. So if you have the sore neck, if you have the eye, whatever. I mean, we all got eyes. <laughs> I know that, right? Uh, that was that was silly. Um, Father, right now, Father, I thank you. There's no distance in the spirit. You've already told us that. Lord, with the authority that you have given us through the blood of Jesus Christ, I command complete healing for our brothers, our sisters, anyone who is in pain. Whatever pain, whatever area, whatever ailment, whatever is going on in this group of people, my God, I thank you, Father, for complete healing. For Margaret, for that um, sensitive skin, whatever is going on there, I thank you, my God, for complete healing in the name of Jesus. You are the God that heals us. You have not changed. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. I thank you, my God, that we are the New Testament church. We have not been taken as yet, so we are still performing miracles. You are still on the throne. The blood of Jesus is still 
powerful and does anything and everything according to your word. There is nothing bigger, better, greater or stronger than the name and the blood of Jesus. And I claim that for all of us. I claim complete healing. I claim health. I claim wealth. I claim all the decrees and the promises in your word. I thank you, my God, that in um, Deuteronomy 28, Lord, that we are blessed. We are not the head and we are not the tail. We are blessed coming in. We are blessed going out. We will not be the, lo the ones who borrow, but we will be the ones who loan out. I thank you, my God, that we are blessed. We are your children. We have been bought with a price. I thank you, my God, that there is no weapon formed against us that shall prosper. You can do, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I thank you, my God, that we are more than conquerors because of what you have done in our life. Lord, that you say if one can put a 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. I thank you, my God, as a corporate group here, we are more powerful than anything that the devil can put up against us because we have you on our side. I thank you, my God, that you are victorious no matter what the world says. You are victorious because I have read the end of the book and you are the Lord who rules and reigns forever. I thank you for that. My brother over there, I believe the Lord is saying to you that I am going to give you joy like you have never, ever, ever experienced before. Joy that will almost, you almost feel like I shouldn't be happy like this. This is not fair that people aren't feeling this. But the joy that you are going to experience, and it's going to start happening as of today, says the Lord, that when you are in people's presence, that you're going to start sort of passing it on. Like I said to Kay and Bob, that they'll be carriers. You'll be a carrier of joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It is all over you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Believe it. Take that. Right now, I even believe that you're even second-guessing this right now. Like you're saying, how can this be so, God? It can't be. But God is saying, believe it. Take this. Take this. The joy of my joy is going to be your strength, says the Lord. Says the Lord. That is so strong. If I had a bucket of joy, I would throw it at you right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, David. That's all you are. Um, altar call. So anyone who wants prayer, you're very welcome to come out. Anyone who wants to get saved, you're very welcome to get saved and accept Jesus. Thank you, people. You have been wonderful. Don't forget, uh, we're back here next week. Um, God's on the throne. He rocks. We're going to have a cup of tea or coffee if you like that as well. So, bless you.